there is some Hari Singh Bisnoya. Uh, I'm, I'll just check. Wait. Yeah, he is from Bhopal. I told them he's a. Uh, yeah. Hmm. He is a plastic surgeon. I've asked this for him. Okay. Two minutes to go. Mm -hmm. Uh, sir, I think it's time. We are, it's seven o'clock now. All right. So allow me a few words about this event and about you and the presentation. So right. uh, welcome everyone. Uh, for all of us, all the IAPS members and all, all the overseas people who are watching this event, I welcome you on behalf of Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons to this platform of IAPS webinar. We have been doing a lot of interesting talks by reputed international and national speakers on various topics in pediatric surgery. In continuation with that, today we are having Dr. Partha Pritam Gupta with us. Uh, Dr. Partha needs no introduction within the community of Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons. For those of the international viewers, uh, uh, I would like to tell them that, that Dr. Partha is a professor of pediatric surgery, ex-head head of the department at Institute of Child Health, and he is the current president of uh, Indian Association of Pediatric Surgeons. Partha, sir, welcome uh, to IAPS webinar. It has been a long wait for your talk on this platform of IAPS webinar. And uh, people are really looking forward to, to this interesting topic of scalpel and the paintbrush. Uh, the title uh, is really interesting. And a uh, uh, lot of people are now gathering on YouTube to uh, wait, waiting to hear from you. We have all the two presidents, uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh and uh, Dr. Ramodar is also there. And without any further delay, I would hand over the stage to you and you can go ahead and start your talk. Uh, I would request all the viewers to post their questions on the chat window of IAPS uh, YouTube channel. And uh, Professor Partha will be very happy to answer those questions at the end of their presentation. So thank you, sir. Thank you once again. And I'll hand over the stage to you. Please start your presentation. Thank you, Ravi. I think uh, I'm audible, I hope. Yes, and, sir, very good. Right. Now, the idea of the scalpel and the paintbrush is just to say that art and science together gives creativity 
And I know sure that in our association, there are a lot of surgeons who are interested in arts, either painting or performing arts. Now that gives you a feeling of a sublime world because our life, our ways as pediatric surgeons are involved in trying our level best to save these babies or in emergencies, which puts an added stress on your life as you grow more older and older in profession. So you need something as a vent. And this reminds me of this great checkered character, Leonardo da Vinci. And he was perhaps the first man who depicted the human anatomy being a grave robber, taking help from the grave robbers, dissecting it out. And his varied interest was in mathematics as also in optics. And people say the muscles and innovations gave an idea to him to create the mesmerizing Mona Lisa. Uh, I thought, not like they're not the image, of course, just to have a double at the panes. And I just picked it up and I had my expressions and my feelings expressed on the first exhibition that was patients. Now, having done that, I realized that it takes you to a sublime world. It's your mind and your hands that work like any surgeon would like to do. And then it's a creativity. Now, every surgeon wants something that would be a creation, be it accession of a tumor or reconstruction. And so I graduated to something which was the first time in this country, making an exhibition on crosswords, which was depicting the poems and verses on canvas. Now, that was quite challenging. And we surgeons always take up challenges to get the best results possible. I continued with long verses from different poets all over the country and in the world. And I like this one. And I thought that this is quite relevant today. This is a uh, charge of the light brigade by Alfred Tennyson. And you can see that the war zone is actually depicted like a chessboard and the soldiers are like pawns, which I truly believe a war is, it's a chess game. And it is relevant today because of the COVID warriors all over the world are not really supported as much as they would have liked. And so this is one of my cherished certificates apart from the ones that I got through my medical career from one of the contemporary reputed well-known artist Jogen Chodhavi. Now, this gives a different feeling altogether that you're doing something. And as I said, it's not my words, it's the words of uh, Albert Einstein who said, the art and science when the meet, it creates a better creativity. So I then started thinking if I could do something to the first children's hospital in India, that's the Institute of Child Health where I work. And this on the left is one which stayed there till 2014. It was established in 1953. And this is the planning over here. And the planning was with matchboxes and straws and micropores, and this is the execution. And this is what all surgeons would do. They would dream, they would plan, and they would execute. This is one of my passion apart from other pediatric surgery that I do, and that's the cleft surgeries. It's so essential in our country with a large population, and the children, most of them are untreated. So I would try and discuss certain cons that I found with a cohort of more than 5,000 patients that I've operated on with cleft lip and palate. It's a single solvable problem. And millions of children around the world are suffering from untreated clefts. Most cannot eat or speak properly or hold a job. And globally, one in 700 children are born with cleft lip and or palate. In our country, estimated per year is around 27 to 30%. And you can see here in this chart that cleft lip, palate, and cleft palate alone 
is also a number here, around 30,000. But surprisingly, the neural tube defects are also 8,000. Now, this is the burden of genetic diseases at birth in India. And we can see that the craniofacial anomalies are 26,950. Now, what's the etiology? There is no etiology, and the answer has not yet been answered, but smoking, alcohol, drugs during pregnancy, and genetic and syndrome are the causes that are thought of. We decided to do a research on the socioeconomic status of cleft lip and this in populations belonging to the eastern part of India. And it was a startling you know, revelation, basically, that it's a mother of, say, a medium socioeconomic class when married to a rather lower socioeconomic class. The chances of having babies born with cleft lip, alveolus, and palate increases. And you can go through the article if you want to. So the socioeconomic status is also a part of the etiology in the formation of lip and palate. Maybe nutritional status plays a role. Now, 27 to 30, 37% of patients might have other anomalies, including cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, facial dysmorphia, or genitourinary system disturbance. And 4% has hypopituitarism of certain kind. Now, this, in our country, with a lot of taboo, a lot of social differences, they think it's a God's wrath, or blame it on Rio, that's the blame it on the mother. And the barriers in treatment are lack of information on treatment options, little or no income to cover the cost of surgery and transportation, manner loss, and the taboos. Now, for the second and third, it's important that we have the charitable organizations like Smile Train, those who operate on 22 states in this country with 160 centers and sponsors these surgeries free or cost to the patient. And naturally, the load is being reduced, the backlog is being reduced. At the ICH, the shock breakup of patients have done over the years before I became associated with my in now, this I found in the Cleveland Clinic like patients and formation sheets, where they say they have a prenatal consult with genetic diagnosis, not possible in our country, but to seem the taping or a nasoalveolar molding. I do not do that, and being practical, it's not possible for the class of people that we have, for the parents, both of them go out to work from early in the morning, leaving the child to somebody. And this actually gets displaced and doesn't give the results that you want to have. The humidity of our country doesn't really help taping in the proper way. And the changes that you need to do is not possible again because of the cost involved in transportation and manner loss. Now, lip adhesion, I do not do. Palette repair, they say they do it at one year, which I think is a little bit late. Speed therapy, velopharyngeal insufficiency surgeries, okay. Orthodontic treatment at six to nine years, and orthonatic surgery 16 to 8 after the skeletal process. Now, we at the Institute of Child Health, we stress on the feeding advice. There are a lot of feeding advices given, even by, you know, Smile train and other places where they have separate kind of uh, feeding bottles, the nipples, and etc. But still, my strict advice is no sucking because uh, it helps after you repair the palate that the child doesn't suck the tongue, which is a deterrent factor for the results that you would have. It will go through later. Now, body weight when five kgs or more and minimum age of three months. I do a primary repair of lip, nose, and alveolus. And the body weight is 8 kgs or more and preferred age of 8 to 11 months. The primary repair of palate is there. And 8 years or more, velopharyngeal insufficiency surgery. There is one thing which is interesting is that gone are the days of the rule of 10. In our country, I have found that it's hard to get a hemoglobin of 
over 10. So you have to accept even if it is 9.95. Now the secondary surgeries like correction of nose, alveolar bone graft, or pedontex, orthonathic surgery, which unfortunately is very costly, and correction of VPI and closure of palatal fistulas are the secondary surgeries. It's actually a jigsaw puzzle. You need a lot of people involved, like starting from the geneticist, the surgeon, the anesthetist, the otolaryngologist, the speech therapist, the cleft nurse, the social worker, even at times the pediatrician and the pediatric cardiologist. And that will fit in to give a complete care to the patient. Now, guidelines and principles that help to avoid complications of lip and palate repair, general clinical history as we discussed, and the protocol is one which works the best in your hands. Because as we all know, there are various surgeries described to repair lips and palate, but I would stick to what I do best, and that is one protocol which works the best in your hands. Now, just to recapitulate that a normal lip, and you can, you can see the Feltral dimple with the feltral columns on the side. You have the nasal sill, you have the columella, you have the cupid's bow, you have the white line, which is important for us when we repair the lip and at the cupid's bow, the vermilion border, and the commissure. Now, I, I deliberately kept this picture as you can see that the commissure on the left side is normal, but on the right side it is not, and there is a macrochelia. So, out of the 5,000 cases we have, around 13 patients with macrochelia and at, with cleft lip and palate. So what happens when we have a lip? So the first is that the, there is a symmetric and displaced nasal tip. The lateral crust is longer and is as shaped. The medial crust naturally is shorter. The base of columella deviated to the non-cleft side attachment of allocartilage at a much lower level, and there is a difference of alveolar level due to hypoplasia of the maxilla. Now with this in mind and the previous photograph, we can well imagine that your correction would be complete only if you have addressed all these problems. Now this is just for documentation because it can come unilaterally or bilaterally. And if it is bilateral, then it can be either complete on one side and complete on the other side, or whatever combination that can happen. Now, the final goal is to bring the child to normal facial appearance at conversational distance. This is so important that you want to bring the child to normal at conversational distance, which thankfully is six feet easy. Now, correction of nasal deformity at the time of primary repair of the lip extensive dissection, but at the right plane to avoid scarring, and proper functioning lips for speech. Now, it's interesting that orbicularis muscle has a dual function. The deep fiber acts like a constrictor and is responsible for the sphincteric action of the mouth, like when you're whistling or smooching. The superficial fiber is the retractor fiber and is related to the facial expression and the precise movements of lips needed in speech. Now, if we consider this baby with right side complete cleft of the lip and palate, you can see the same as we described in the abdominals in a cleft lip. Now this is incomplete right sided cleft lip. This is bilateral incomplete cleft lip. This is also bilateral incomplete cleft lip. Now here is a complete bilateral of the lip alveolus and palate where the premaxilla is protruding and it's rotated, the torsion of the premaxilla. And it's an interesting finding that whenever you have such patients, most of them has the deviation of the torsion towards the left. This is perhaps the most important step when you're repairing a lip that's mobilizing the lateral lip and alveolus. base that is to lift it up from it, which is lower down, as you can see in this worm view. So you have to lift it up to get it to the level, as you will see in the following slides. Now, I believe in doing a tenancy. That's a third triangular flat. 
Melad is the other one, which is the upper third triangular third. Now, as I said before, you do what is best in your hand. And to do that, all that you need is very simple. I don't use the calipers. You can see the impression of the skin hole where you pull it and try and make the color mill straight. Take the markings as we all know. Use the Cupid's bow here. And then take a line in the midline, a lateral cut where this will come in. Now, we are interested in mobilization of the lateral alacar. Nature always gives you a clue, a line, a lane to work with. And you can see this white line where you would incise to lift the lip, the microsurface. And let's get back to this. And here you see that this is an incision. I use a diatomy at, to work at the subperiosteal level or the alveolar over there. And here you can see it's another patient with another view where this is actually the line where we would cut to mobilize the lateral allocate. This is another view where you can see from the inside because there's a distinct difference in the color of the epithelium where you're going. And as usual, they have a hypertrophic inferior turbinate. So now you have cut it. Now, as soon as you cut it, you can see it's like this. And this is the portion which will be rotated inside to make the nasal flow. And here, I a bipolar anatomy. And as I said, with the markings, it will go up from here and go inside there. And having done that, you can now realize that we have done the nasal flow and the allocotyl so that we are left with suturing the muscles. And you can see this will come here. And this is the ultimate result. And if you compare the results, the level of the nose is the same. Now, this notch, I specifically kept it because accept it. If you have a notch here, they clear up in three months' time, as I would show you in the slides later. Here also, you have this thing. But what you notice is that the, this is lifted up, the filtral columns are made, and this nas or the nasal cells are at the same level, which is your aim. And of course, the column is straight. Here it was deviated to the non flap slide. Now watch this baby. This baby weighed in 2008 or baby. The following slides are the same. And as you've seen, there is a notch. And this baby comes back after two and a half years with much elation to the parents and surgeon concerned. You cannot see anything, no notch, whatever. The same here, the we operated about 17 years of age in our hospital, and this is what we get at times. But again, all of them you can see that the color miller is straight, so we have done a good job, and the filtrum is also in the proper position. Here also the same thing, no matter how grotesque it looks, and you create, if you are suturing the muscles properly, the nasolabial furrow also is created. And you can also, as you've seen in the previous slide, the tubercle is also done. So all we want is everybody to smile and smile properly, again, at a conversational distance. So I'm not disheartened because every case cannot be hunky dory Now, looking at the bilateral lips, the incomplete bilateral lips, on the right is the most difficult one. And you can see the difference of the incompleteness of the formation of the lip. Now, this we shown before with a rotation of the max. So here again, I do a forked flap repair described by Barsky and Hagedorn way back in the 1930s. And I believe that this is a very good method where you can get the depth of the lip keeping the central portion, because not always will you have a good prolate. So you make an ins markings like this with a midline, and the second is from the sides. And if you notice that this midline point is the actual length that you would make a point here. So these two will form the fork flap, which will come and attach here, as in this picture. So what we essentially do is rotate this one and then take these two together and it gives a fantastic repair. 
And you can see again that the nasal lateral alar cartilage being mobilized, it comes up so nicely like this. And ultimately it's the same thing in a schematic way where you get a full lip done if you look into the view. Now I kept this here specifically because this child had a problem. I couldn't mobilize that much. And this is here for an ideal candidate for a secondary surgery. Here you can see what happens at times is the rolling up of the or uh, orbicularis oris. You have to dissect very carefully, and you remember that orbicularis oris has got two parts. Now, this is quite normal. And as I said before, that it's a fine thing that most of them are proportion on the left side. And here you are with a grotesque looking lip, but with Vasky Hagedon, and you need a repositioning of the pre maxilla in these patients. I do not use a nail or anything. I just use the port suture closure and just attach it to the uh, margins when I reposition it. And you can see that all the goals have been met and on the natural side also. So everybody would look normal. Now, secondary surgery for again, like you can see this child who had done what undergone a cleft lip repair, a bilateral one, somewhere else came to me. Now, the best thing to notice about these guys is that the eye, it says all, because you know. They get a different confidence having a proper lip. That's the case that we have. Now, this left on the left, see the smile on the mouth. Now, here I would show you a bilateral cleft lip and palate, which was operated in 2013. And the child is now normal, goes to school, accepting that would need a secondary orthognathic surgery later on. Hello, Look at their uh, speech, you know. Um, so at one time, people used to think that the repair of the lip is for cosmetic reasons and the palate is for functional reasons. But it's totally wrong. Because if you can't construct the lip properly with the muscles, your speech cannot be normal. Now, commonly seen surgical errors in pet falls are suboptimal outcome because of poor operative planning again. Go back to my previous statements. Operative error, poor operative scar contraction, and non compliance of calcium, which is quite common in our country. Coming to cleft palate, again, the documentation would be like I said here. Yeah. Now, here you can notice that there is a cleft of the soft palate, but if you look closely here, there is definitely a submucous palate, which always comes as blue line. And this one is interesting because you can see a hole here, which is a spontaneous perforation of the submucous cleft palate extending above the ear and the cleft there. Now, this condition can happen even in teens where the submucous cleft palate has been missed. It needs to be operated as soon as you see it in the early stage to have a proper functioning palate and speech. Now, to repair a palate, I believe in the two flap technique, and the best thing that we can see is primary repair use the watertight closure of the oval flaps, a competent velopharyngeal port, minimal raw areas to avoid detrimental effect on growth of the nucleus, and proper creation of a muscular sling so that the passivant ridge is active and the port does not allow the air to sneak out from the nasal passage. So here you can see that the dissection goes like this, and the muscles 
the muscles would be here when you find it straight. Now the nasal layer is separated from the posterior margin of the palatine bone and then stitched up. So the orientation, the sling that we are talking about can be evident. And as I said, it should be a watertight closure and it actually works like a mushroom, you know, with a greater palatine vessels on both sides. This area is packed at times to prevent some irregular losing and the pack is removed the next day. And usually it takes about 10 days for this portion to heal and get the proper mucosa. You can see in this one, this child is about three and a half years old, and you can well imagine that the muscles are contracting properly and the uvula is stayed there. But this is another patient who had a palate, which was a bilateral incomplete heart palate and complete left of the soft palate. And <laughs> this kind of palate what you have is a pretty white palate with no tissue. Yeah. I wasn't sure whether it will break down or not. Okay. But coming to two foreigners and everything. You know, that's the beauty and that's the satisfaction that you get. Now, can we get all cleft palate patients speaking normally? No. Can we get all cleft palate patients repaired without fistula? No. Can we avoid detrimental effect on growth of maxilla? Again, a big no. We have to remember that and not get disheartened. Now, again, we have found that this is a lip and palate and Oh, Shivam is coming from school? Yes. Oh. 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 <laughs> coming from school? Yes. Oh. Your class. KG1, very good. You go to the normal school. So that's what you aim for. That's what you thrive for, as you would paint to the best of your capability. Now, as I said before, you cannot avoid fistula. And the reasons may be wrong selection of patient, anterior palate has precarious blood supply, especially in depth, an improper use of diathermy, and non compliant parents. And as I said, that if they start sucking, they come from the second post of the day, they may God save. So the methods of treatment would be orthodontic, where they'll give a plate, a tongue flap. I really love this method of repair of fistula with a tongue flap because you get a white. Vascular, muscular, thing. or the local flaps and cheek or buckle flap or facial artery muscular mucus. Now, this is one of the ideal patients for me to do a tongue flap. As you can see, it's an anterior based flap, and the left is after I have placed the trunk flap, and the right is after the detachment after 14 days. Now, this is done again at around the age of eight or nine years because it needs some cooperation from the patient or from the parents. Or you can do a local flap where possible, a rotation flap, and to complete the fistula. But this is very important, the velopharyngeal dysfunction and an overt cleft palate, either before or after repair, by far the most common cause of velopharyngeal dysfunction. This condition occurs in approximately one 2000 and VPD has been reported in as many as 30 to 50 percent of patients following palatal. So you have to accept that all patients may not speak as normally as I have shown you in my videos because of this one. You can see that if there is a velopharyngeal insufficiency, the axillary muscles are used, there will be head bobbing, there may be contraction of the nasal muscles. As you can see in this speech, it's not at all good. Bolo, George say bolo. A, mm. me, mm. he, mm. he. See the effort that the girl is having. Mm -mm. Now, for that, the furlough's palatoplasty is to the test of time, which lengthens the palate while both tightening and retropositioning the liver to sling, which is so important. 
Limited tightening is most consistently associated with improved speech output. Now, just basically, it's a Z plasty where the aponeurosis and everything is cut, and so it continues with the formation of the sling problem. Or you can do a posterior wall augmentation in mild to moderate BPI with small velocity. And the materials used are cartilage, fat, fascia, or even you can make a shelf out of the mucosal layer over the breastfeed and the wall of the pharynx. Now, if you have this child, I'm showing you this child because I have started the posterior wall augmentation and I've already reported the preliminary report by using the D-flux that we use for the VURs, because it stays for at least 10 years. And the principle being the same, that you just augment the posterior wall with the ridge, you do a nasal endoscopy and find out how much it's moving and what the gap is lying. And then with the nasal endoscopy in place, via the oral route, you just go in, hit the passive wound ridge, and raise the mucosa there with T flux, and it works wonders. And this is the case who had a very, very bad nasal intonation in his speech. I gave a T flux months back, and I wanted to give it another one because it improved so much. <laughs> So now, if they can say Tata, that's the most important phonetic, uh, you know, things going on by playing the air around your mouth. And uh, I think I'm happy. But at this age, one more thing is that they need intense speech therapy. And this is what I want from all my patients with the lip and palate. On the left is one that I had op operated. And on the right, that one that I painted from my... And lastly, I believe in this so strongly, is for my juniors that you are a student or career. Thank you. Ravi, I end my talk now. Sir, thank you so much. It has been an excellent presentation and there is so much of appreciation on the YouTube chat window. And Dr. Ramesh and everybody else, they are greatly appreciating your talk. It was yeah. great listening to you again, and uh, it is really a craft, and it really takes a takes an artist to do the, these kind of procedures. And uh, I, with that, I'll just forward you some questions and read out some of them which have been posted by the viewers. Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of antenatal counseling you do for these patients if they come to you during the antenatal period? Uh, first and foremost, is I just show a few of the photographs and the videos to allay their anxiety and then tell them what we tell people when they bring their child later on, that what precautions they need to take and that everything will be normal. That's all that you need to do for the counseling because so far the genetic studies are not that, you know, well uh, versed amongst the society in our country, especially for cleft lip and palate. Yeah. Uh, what about how about feeding patients with bilateral total cleft lip and total cleft palate? Do you in, indicate? Do you tell them about gavage feeding? This is from some overseas viewer by the name Imnain Peed. Mm -hmm. um, so he's no. asking bilateral total cleft lip and palate. How? What is the strategy for feeding? This feeding feeding is very simple. You see. Uh, Gavage feeding means that you are putting in a nasogastric tube and it's not necessary. Even if you have a periroba syndrome, it's not necessary. All that you need to do is that you use a spoon, a small spoon, and just deliver the milk slowly. Say, uh, I mean, just for an example, maybe less than a mil in each feed. I mean, start off. So if you continue, and what I say is that for a, to a mother or the caregiver who has brought the child that if a normal baby would suck say, an ounce of milk 
in 10 minutes time, you need to give at least 40 minutes time for a cleft baby to be fed an ounce of milk. And that is with a spoon. Some people may use a dropper. And I, I, I really am averse to any other kind of eating. Dr. Kaushik Saha is asking, correction of palate around one year often leads to mid-phase hypoplasia. What is your experience in this rate? No, I haven't, I haven't found anything. Because you, you see, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a debatable situation. Your idea of constructing the palate is a better functioning. Now, if you accept that, whether you would consider doing it later, because I did, I do it at the babbling speech time, as I said before, around the nine or around that time. I haven't seen in my follow up of uh, till the age of 17, that's when the growth is nearly getting complete, that there is uh, any regression, repression of the mid phase hyperplasia or doing that. And uh, I would rather think that the uh, uh, priority should be to give them a price. Uh, Dr. Shilpa is asking, uh, which age do you prefer to do the lips and the clefts? Have you ever done them together in an older child? Uh, that's a very interesting question, and I expected it, Shilpa. IGD, if I say I said around nine kilos of weight, uh, I would operate on a palate. Now, say a child comes to me with a weight of, say, 7.5 with a lip and palate. I would rather wait for the child to gain some weight and do the lip and palate together. Because when you do a lip and palate together, you start off repairing the palate, come out, and then repair the lip. The chances of anterior fistula in my series is much, much, much less. And it is easier to repair the palate than having repaired the lip and then go in later when the child attains the weight to repair the palate. Because the anterior palate is always a difficult place then to suture in a watertight way. Dr. Ramesh has posted a question that Dr. Ramesh Sanat Krishnan, that are you an artistic surgeon or a surgical artist? Which I actually answered on your behalf as both, but feel free to answer it. I, I remember, I remember uh, an advertisement of uh, Tata Steve. I also do surgery. Yeah. Dr. Ravi Kumar was amongst the audience. Uh, I would thank Dr. Ravi Kumar Hi, sir, sir. to be there for the presentation. He, is, he said that in complete cleft palate, island flap based on greater palatine artery reduces valvopharyngeal incompetence when inserted between the hard and soft palate junction. Do you do this procedure? No, sir. I don't do that. I believe in the two flap technique with the dissections, uh, uh, you know, as I have shown in the picture. And Ravi, um, for information of all the members of our association, Dr. Ravi Kumar sir is also a very well-known painter and an artist. Yeah, uh, and he was one of the coordinator of the Smile Train also. Uh, he yeah, yeah. Message me this, this morning that uh, he, he was one of the coordinators for Smile Train. And yes, he, uh, yes, he was. Yeah, yeah. We hear from him sometime. Yeah. That's all about the questions which are posted. There are a lot of comments which you can go back and read. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, people are uh, discussing over there. There is a bit of discussion over the loss of domain uh, of this particular speciality, uh, which is now being more and more going towards the plastic surgery team. But I think it is all about uh, what you do. And if you are, whatever procedure you are able to do, you should do it. So what's Absolutely. your opinion that now more and more plastic surgeons are doing this procedure rather than the pediatric surgeon? And there is a lack of training for this particular procedure for our trainees. Yeah, because basically, you see, it's a, it's a kind of a, a condition where both the 
plastic surgeons and the pediatric surgeons, if trained properly, even amongst plastic surgeons, they can do a good job. And I, uh, in my institute, there had been MCH candidates for plastic surgery um, who came and worked with me for a period of three to five months uh, to learn the tricks of the trade. So I don't see any problem in the pediatric surgeons if they're trained properly to do the cut surgeries. And uh, another thing that I always believe in is that if a pediatric surgeon is well-trained, to do such things, as we do say a thoracotomy or a urological surgery, I think it's in a way a little better in the post-operative management too, without taking anything away from the plastic surgeons and their teams. If you're doing this in the pediatric age group, which is the perfect age group to do the thesis, um, why not a pediatric surgeon? Dr. Ramadwar has just posted one question. And we'll take this as the last question. What is your experience with the tongue flap repair of the cleft palate? I think you mentioned that uh, you you do do this. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. I, I think I think that's one of the one of the best way and a simple way to close the fistulas, even if it's a large one, because you're having a mass of tissue well vascularized, and then with an anterior based flap. Uh, you just keep it for 14 days, that's the inconvenience. But it works very well. I never had to redo a fistula having done a tongue flap. Okay. Dr. Bagri has just posted one comment. What about neonatal cleft lip repair? No, sir. I haven't done it. It was in vogue in the American circuit once. Uh, I haven't done it because I don't believe that it is good. Okay, sir. I think uh, we are yep. done with the questions, and uh, I think it was a great talk. People really enjoyed it. It is it is one such topic where we do not discuss much in our national conferences, and uh, not many pediatric surgeons publish on this. And I'm sure your your work uh, would inspire a lot of us mm -hmm. and help to train our postgraduates. And you know, anytime, anytime. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I thank all the viewers who are watching us for uh, uh, being here for this topic. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing some other topics sometime soon. So thank you for joining, sir. Thank you once again. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Good night. Take, take care. Mm.